want to bring on board uh, Swaminathan Ankaleshwar Iyer, consulting editor with Economic Times, someone we've uh, admired, respected his views for, his views on economy, markets, world in general uh, are something which really force you to think, force you to reassess, force you to understand the new normal. So what really could be the new normal for 2022? What are the factors which are at play? Swami, fantastic to have you on ET Now. Thank you for joining us. Wishing you a wonderful uh, year ahead and season's greetings from, uh, from Team ET Now. Swami, let's discuss the economic setup for India. As we, as we, uh, you know, as we step into 2022, what, what would you say are the headwinds and the tailwinds? Well, you know, it can be the best of worlds and the worst of worlds. <laughs> uh, because we have bounced back very well from the COVID. I mean, we find that the revenue uh, pro the revenue projections are very good, well above uh, expectations. Uh, growth has been very good in 2021. You find that the IMF is predicting that for this, this coming financial year, India may have 8.5% GDP growth, which would be the fastest in the world. So, I mean, since this is a post-COVID year, uh, not just comparing with a very bad year, so the potential appears to be extremely high. Uh, extremely high provided no particular new disaster comes about. So the potential is very high, 8.5% GDP growth. Uh, after a fast year, this year itself is expected to be 9.510 maybe. So after this, to have another 8.5 would be very, very good. Uh, it would appear that revenue projections are going to continue to be high. Exports had been hardly more or less stagnant since 2014. Now, suddenly, they have boomed in the last year. Uh, obviously, compared with the previous year, it's not to be uh, looked at seriously. But if you compare with two years ago, export, uh, exports are up more than 30%. It's like an annual average of almost 15% a year. So that is an extremely heartening thing that after so many years of stagnancy, suddenly we are pushing up. Uh, exports used to be about $300 billion a year. This year it may touch $400 billion. And there is no reason to expect that would be reversed next year. Many of the commodity prices and other prices have been high. The service exports have been buoyant. So if you are on a very wide scale of things, uh, India's prospects are quite promising. There are a lot of good tailwinds. Uh, global interest rates have been as low as you can think of. They are negative in real terms. And foreign money has been pouring into our startups. FDI might be $60, $70 billion. Uh, your foreign portfolio investment, they have pulled out a little, but that has been more than compensated for by an extremely resilient domestic sector. And this again is an extremely positive trend uh, as we go into 2022. So I should say these are the tailwinds and it would appear that these things can take us forward, assuming no bad surprises come up ahead. So specifically, what do you make of the headwinds then? We've spoken about the tailwinds, but what about uh, headwinds? The most obvious headwind would be uh, a resurgence of COVID. Apart from health, which are the other headwinds, uh, inflation is a headwind. The wholesale price index in the last year, it was up 14%. I mean, that is really enormous. Uh, it has already been in double digits for eight, nine months, and that is very unusual. The consumer price index much, much lower, four to five percent. But you know, I'm pretty sure the consumer price index is going to be pulled upward towards the wholesale rate in the months to come. And this is going to affect purchasing power. This is going to be one of the headwinds, especially if, as a consequence of this, we get a significant rise in interest rates across the whole world as central banks begin to tighten money to combat inflation. In the United States, the, already the central bank has given notice of three increases in interest rates this year. In India, I think it will also follow. The world over, it will follow. Now, if it is only this much, I think the world has taken it into account. 
And although there was a terrific outflow out of all emerging markets, if you remember back in 2013, the taper tantrum. Right now, because advance notice has been given, I don't think you will get a huge outflow right now. But suppose inflation persists and it looks as though the interest rates are going to go up even further. Then it is possible that this once again turns into a sort of panic and the exit of money out of it India and out of all emerging markets suddenly becomes much faster. It is a possibility. But cross your fingers and let's hope things work out. So I would say these are the three big uh, headwinds, the COVID, the interest rates, the uh, inflation. Good morning. Uh, good chatting with you as always. So let's uh, build on that more, uh, Swaminathan, I guess, particularly on inflation, one of the things that you've just red flagged. Uh, will it kill growth because the CAPEX cycle, which is reviving, is very real after 10 years? How should the government and the central banks uh, balance this? We need to strike a proper balance between inflation and growth. Uh, till now, the central bank, the reserve bank, has been favoring growth, I would say, over worrying about inflation. And yet beyond the point, I think everybody knows that if it looks as though this inflation is not temporary, as some people thought, some people said, you know, this is a consequence of shipping delays, this is a consequence of some commodity prices shooting up, and some of them are starting to come down again. And these are temporary things which will go away. I think it's now clear that it's not just temporary. The world has pumped so much money into the global economy in the last two years that the structural inflation is now coming in. High wages are coming in in a very large number of cases. So it looks as though it's getting institutional. It, do, it does look as though we must be prepared for higher interest rates. However, in India, but going by wholesale price inflation, that is so high that real interest rates in India, I think, would remain negative. To that point, to, from that point of view, it will not discourage investment. It will encourage capex. It may discourage some purchases of consumer goods uh, on equated monthly installments. That may get adversely affected. Yes. As far as capex is concerned, I think we will still be in an era of negative real interest rates, and that is always good for CapEx. The other thing CapEx requires is what would be the foreign inflows, especially into the startups. That is still looking very good. The flow is looking extremely strong. India is supposed to have created, I think, about 60, 70 new unicorns in 2021. There is no sign of that trend abating. So we can hope that that will go up. Domestically, CapEx is going to depend on the extent of government spending. The good news out there is that the revenues have been extremely high, you know, uh, maybe 20% up in uh, nominal terms almost, uh, if you look at some of the recent trends. If that trend continues in 2022, there is going to be lots of money available for investment. And uh, to build on that point further, the government spending, the expenditure for the need to continue to pump prime the economy for that disinvestment is going to play such a big role, an ambitious target. Air India going to the Tatas, uh, to the Tatas, uh, but this is going to be so crucial. The rest of the pipeline, which could not be completed this year, and that's what we need to watch out for in the budget as well. There are two problems here. One is the government itself wants to go easy and slow on reform. I think it has been bitten very badly by the farmer's agitation and worrying about that. Because of that farmer's agitation, for instance, there were these four labor laws which were passed to unify various other courts and so on. And although those have been passed by parliament, there have been the president has signed off, they have not yet been notified. And that appears, according to everybody, that the government is funking anything like this, at least before the elections to UP and Punjab. So till then, nothing further will be done. And because of that, it is felt that the government is going slow on the monetization of assets. Uh, the national monetization pipeline is supposed to get lakhs of crores within a, uh, a few years. Will that really happen with this kind of output, uh, uh, slowdown of uh, reforms, we don't know. But yes, I think this we should mention as a headwind. Suppose the BJP does very badly or even loses the UP election. I think a kind of panic will set in 
that reforms are unpopular. Let us not do privatization. Let us not go forward on the labor codes. So there will be various negative signals sent out there to the economy. So from, I mean, uh, a lot of liberals like me would be, might be very happy to see the BJP lose the UP election. But from the point of view of the economy, a bad BJP loss, I think, would mean a sudden squeeze, a sudden slowdown in the entire reform process, and that would not be good for the economy. Right. Swami, so you are essentially saying that the outcome of the UP election could decide the speed of reforms going forward? And if the BJP does reasonably well in UP, I think it will feel encouragement that this farmer's agitation was a small, very powerful section, not to be confused with the overall general mood. And therefore, it will then pursue other reforms more vigorously. And we need that. I mean, you will find that there are going to be strikes and uh, agitations against every privatization, even just the national monetization pipeline. If you are trying to say, let me recycle old assets, let me sell old ports, old airports, old roads, and use the money to in fact invest in green feed. Even that process depends on some measure of public support. If you find that there are a large number of strikes out there, you will run into trouble. For instance, the official electricity policy now is that the performance of the state-owned discoms has been so bad, so bad, that frankly, reform from within is not possible. Let us privatize all the discoms. This is the official policy of New Delhi. And yet in practice, when they tried in Uttar Pradesh, the, all the electricity staff threatened to strike. They say, we will shut down the entire state. Nobody dared to face this risk before the elections. So the government immediately surrendered, surrendered and said, okay, we will just have negotiations uh, on how to improve performance. Again, in Chandigarh and uh, Pondicherry, I mean, there are various union territories where this government can go ahead and do it because the central government, in effect, uh, rules these states. Even there, you know, they are going ahead cautiously, slowly. Uh, so let us see how it goes. Without doubt, the reform process is in danger if the BJP has a serious defeat. On the other hand, the reform process will get a boost if the BJP has a good victory in UP. Hmm. Swami, the only thing here is that here in India, we could soon see the end of easy liquidity. Could that really spell trouble or do you think it could be different this time around? As long as it is within expectations, it should not spell trouble. You know, the problems always arise when something is very unexpected. So if there is some kind of huge rise in inflation and some big crackdown, uh, which is in excess of market expectations and liquidity dries up much faster than expected, then, of course, you could have a problem. I don't think that's going to happen. So finally, Swami, last year was like a budget like never before. Solid in terms of numbers, very uh, open in terms of the assumptions. What is in store? to your mind from this year's budget because the compulsions of the economy are very, very different. We were searching for growth. Now growth is evident. As I said, the budget is going to come before the UP election. To my mind, the election outcome is more important than the budget. The budget is going to put forward policies, but uh, the main thing about the budget is not just the figures. It will come out with some figures on the fiscal deficit, how much you're going to invest here, there. There will be some talk of some reforms. But all of this will be dependent on the political outcome, which the, those results are going to come out in late March. So in late March, we will be in a position to say, OK, the budget is part of the picture. The election is the other part of the picture. We will then put the two of them together and then see which way are we going. So within the budget, I would expect a continuation of what's happening right now. Uh, since the trends so far have been quite good on the fiscal and other side, the GST collections have been strong, revenue collections have been strong, the direct connect, uh, taxes have done reasonably well. So I think there will be an assumption in the budget of substantial increase in revenue. This 8.5% growth which the IMF has talked about, I'm sure the budget will take a similar kind of outlook. 
And because of this, it will be possible to have very substantial increases in infrastructure spending and in some welfare spending. I'm sure all of that will be in the budget. As far as the reforms are concerned, they've already announced so many reforms. I'm not sure how much further they are going to go. Uh, I do not know, for instance, whether they will go any further on privatization, uh, mo policy monetization, uh, project monetization. We will have to see what happens on those. As far as tax rates are concerned, I think the emphasis will be on stability. I don't think there will be any changes. The income tax exemption limit at 5 lakhs is already extremely high, extremely high. Uh, and I don't think they will uh, change that particular thing at this point of time. Again, the peak income tax rate, again, has become quite high. So I don't think they will change that. The corporate tax rate, you know, Nirmala Sitharaman said 15% for people who don't avail of other tax breaks. That's a major announcement. And I think they will continue with that right through this entire term because it makes no change. Uh, it makes no sense to change the corporate tax policy one year on such a radical measure and then keep changing it again and again. So I think you will see some stability in the tax rates. Uh, the emphasis will be on continuity. That they said, you know, we are going to have these various welfare measures. We are going to have a running water in every house. What are the steps you're going to make towards that particular role? Um, there will be some more on helping startups. There is some tension on the small and medium sector industries, which the BJP regards as a very important uh, vote bank. They will try and do something for that. So I would say these are the directions. The emphasis will be on continuity rather than on any major new initiatives. In my oh, it's Swami. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful 2022. And let's take a break. When we come back, we'll connect with Ramesh. We'll talk about the comeback in the rural economy. How real is it for Mahindra and Mahindra Financials?